how do we do that? Um, where's the link? Uh, in the newsletter. It's the only place, or maybe. Uh, no, the link to register. The link to join the webinar, the Zoom, the Zoom link. Yeah. So it should have been sent to all the people. It should have gone automatically out. Once you registered. Once you registered in Eventbrite. Maybe an event, right? Yeah. Okay then, welcome everyone. Uh, Steve Kenzie here, I'm the Executive Director for the UN Global Compact Network UK. Uh, thanks for joining. The purpose of our webinar today is to, um, I guess three, three, three key messages. After I tell you very briefly about um, the UN Global Compact, we'll just cover off what are the SDGs, why should business care about the SDGs and what can business do about the SDGs? So firstly, um, on the, on the global compact. We are mobilizing a global movement of sustainable companies and stakeholders to create the world we want. It is the UN's corporate sustainability initiative launched in 2000 with just 40 signatories. Now we have over 10,000 business participants and another 3,500 non-business participants in 160 countries. And there are 70 local networks like the UK network, um, all around the world where you can, um, if you have offices there or uh, significant operations of any kind, then, then they can be a useful partner for you on the ground uh, in, in these other countries. At the core, I suppose, of the UN Global Compact are 10 principles. Uh, they're all derived from UN treaties in the areas of human rights, labor, environment, and anti-corruption. And we, we really, uh, refer to them, I guess, as universal principles for multinational companies, for companies with supply chains that extend around the world. Having uh, a code um, that's, that's derived from universal principles we feel is tremendously valuable. And um, this really informs everything that we do. To join the Global Compact requires a commitment from the CEO to the 10 principles. And the CEO is required to write a letter to the Secretary General, hand on heart, committing to operationalize the 10 principles in, in everything that your, your business does. And then to report annually on your progress towards that end and to support the wider UN development agenda. And of course that wider UN development agenda at the moment is best defined by the sustainable development goals. So what are the goals? Take you back to 1987, um, Gro Brundtland, former prime minister of Norway, led a UN commission on our common future. And from that uh, came this very elegant definition of what, what sustainable development actually is. Development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. And that, that 1987 report we set in motion um, further work in this space, which led in 2000 to the launch of the um, Millennium Development Goals. These goals were dreamed up by a small group of experts at the UN and they, they sought to identify some key, some key buttons that if we pushed, you know, some, some key levers, I suppose, for really um, significantly improving uh, the lot of the most people around the world. And these the eight goals with 16 more specific targets beneath them um, proved to be a very effective mechanism for mobilizing resources and energy uh, towards these um, challenges. And while the goals weren't all achieved, they demonstrated the efficacy of this approach such that in 2012 at the Rio plus 20 conference, it was agreed um, that the SDGs would be launched 
So the, the MDGs ran from 2000 to 2015, and it was agreed that the SDGs would be launched to go from 2015 to 2030 to continue the good work um, begun with the Millennium Development Goals, but also to correct, correct, I think, some of the shortcomings in that agenda. And to ensure that that was achieved, it was no longer uh, possible to, to do this next step really without uh, consulting stakeholders. And so the, rather than a small group of experts leading the way, uh, the UN undertook the, the largest consultation that they've ever done. And, and it, for us here in the UK, it, it kicked off in fact with a high level panel that toured the world and that, that panel was co-chaired by David Cameron. And they sketched out the broad, the broad strokes um, that, that eventually led to the SDGs. Um, the goals were passed uh, by all 193 member states of the UN at the General Assembly in uh, 2015, and they came into effect on January 1st, 2016. There are 17 goals. Um, beneath the goals, 169 more specific targets, and beneath the targets, 232 global indicators to measure our progress towards achieving the goals. They cover people, planet, prosperity, peace and partnerships. They, it's a, a truly holistic and comprehensive agenda that leaves no one behind and the goals are tremendously interconnected. It, it is a really holistic agenda that is meant to bring about the future that we want. Now, for many people, this view of the goals uh, may well be all you've ever seen. And, and so you, would be, you could be forgiven for thinking perhaps goal two, for example, zero hunger is fairly limited in scope and perhaps less applicable to a developed country. And I forgot to mention earlier, this was one of the shortcomings of the MDGs was they only applied to developing countries. The SDGs are truly global and every country um, is expected to contribute to achieving them. So on goal two, zero hunger um, may conjure up images of, of famine, but in fact, the full text of the goal is to end hunger, achieve food security and improve nutrition and promote sustainable agriculture. A much wider agenda um, that includes eliminating famine, but, but goes beyond that and brings in, of course, really every country um, is gonna have an interest here. And if we go a step further down to the level of the targets, you can see again a bit more, I think that the richness of the sustainable development goals um, in their entirety. So target 2.1 to end hunger and ensure access to food for all is what you would expect to see under zero hunger. But 2.2 broadens the agenda significantly. And now we're talking about all forms of malnutrition. So really everything to do with diet and, and, and particularly from a developed country perspective, obesity falls in uh, to, the, to, the, to the agenda. 2.3, to double the agricultural productivity and incomes of small scale food producers speaks to, I think, the, the importance culturally in, in most countries of the family farm and smallholder farmers and their important contributions they make to the, to the food chain, but equally, this is one where we really see the knock on effect to if we can help double the productivity of small scale food producers, that's gonna have a big impact on the first goal to eliminate poverty. And, and that then subsequently will improve health and well being, and it will allow children to go to school and it will contribute to gender equality. And the knock on effects are, are quite profound. 2.4, to ensure sustainable food production systems and implement resilient agricultural practices. Um, this is just obviously as smart to be thinking about more resilience in our food systems. The, the world has evolved, um, especially the developed world, into you know, monocultures and, and very few species of plant now responsible for um, feeding uh, millions and millions of people. Um, there's a risk associated with that and it needs to be addressed. Further to that point, and perhaps the, the target that might be the least expected um, is to 2.5 to maintain the genetic diversity of seeds, plants and animals. But of course, if we're thinking about the future and uh, 
safeguarding and the future we want, we need to protect uh, the diversity of, of our agricultural system. And that is why that's in there. I think this is, if we were to do this exercise with every one of the goals, you would find there was one in there that you might not have thought of um, just by looking at the icon. For example, in uh, goal three on health and well-being, um, one of the targets is to reduce by half um, deaths and injury from um, traffic accidents, um, which of course is obvious given that, that that's uh, a leading cause of death and injury around the world. Um, and so it's in there. Now you'll see, you'll note uh, on the targets that they change from, from numbers to letters. And, and that just is a subtle difference in that now we're talking about a, a target to change more the process rather than a, a, an absolute thing. So uh, two point A, to increase investment in rural infrastructure. Two point B, uh, correcting distortions in world agricultural markets and, and C, to ensure proper functioning of food commodity markets. I would really encourage you to go through this. Um, if you are looking at becoming more familiar with the SDGs, um, it really is the case that the, the true impacts are at the level of the targets. And so it's really important that you be familiar with what's happening there. I, I'll come back to that um, a little bit later. So why should you care uh, about the SDGs? Well, uh, I guess the obvious business reason, um, the, the goals envision no, nothing really less than a, a complete transformation in society and, and the economy between now and 2030. In any transformation on that scale, there will be massive business opportunity as long as you're on the right side of it. And the Business and Sustainable Development Commission, which launched alongside the goals effectively um, to look at the, the business implications, found $12 trillion of new business value a year just in three key sectors um, related to this transformation. It, it's really clear when you start looking at it again that there's massive opportunity for business in in this agenda. But more, more obviously even, this is a pro-business agenda. At the macro level, better educated and more productive workforce uh, is good for business. Economic and political stability, good for business. Fair and just societies, good for business and likewise climate resilience. At the micro level, this agenda, if you are engaged actively in this agenda, your business is more attractive for investors and customers. We're seeing this more and more, um, the interest in the investment community in ESG, really more and more ESG equals SDG, and, and the two are, are very closely aligned. Much of, if you're gonna engage around SDGs, much of the activity is gonna be in your supply chain and, and, and that extra attention is gonna improve management there. It will improve access to public procurement and public investment. Um, as an example, the UK's Department for International Development has made it a requirement that, that all of their, uh, their grant recipients and suppliers be UN Global Compact participants. While not expressly saying engage with the SDGs, by participating in UNGC, you, you are making that commitment to the SDGs and that's helping, um, it's opening up access to customers that you wouldn't otherwise have. Perhaps the, the, the most direct link between engaging on SDGs and the bottom line for a company would be improved competitiveness in hiring the best human capital. I think it's well known now that the, the best and the brightest, the people that can choose where they want to work will choose to work for a company with a, with a purpose um, over one that, that doesn't have one. And again, nothing defines the, really the, the interests of society better right now than the SDGs. If the opportunities around the SDGs aren't enough, then um, this slide is intended to highlight some of the risks associated with not engaging around the SDGs. Um, starting with the, the picture of the prime minister, I would draw your attention to his lapel pin and that is in fact, you know, an SDG pin. Um, and this image was recently substituted in the presentation because I also have a picture of Theresa May with, a, with an SDG pin. Um, while the government hasn't been 
particularly vocal in its endorsement of the SDGs, they did sign up and they are aware. The mechanism by which they are implementing the SDGs is through the single department plans um, of every department. And whereas in the past, these single department plans were largely about how do they operationalize uh, the party manifesto upon which they're elected, now it's both the manifesto and the SDGs that are being uh, addressed in these plans. So while it may not be as visible as we would like, um, everyone should be aware that the government is committed to this agenda. They are taking action. It is already influencing government policy and will continue to do so in the future. So I think as in anything that's influencing government policy, I think it is incumbent upon business to be aware of it. Um, the, the headline with Mark Carney, that's just from just two days ago. Um, and and I, I use this to draw out, I suppose, the, the inevitability of this agenda. So he's been, this um, corporation's told to draw up climate rules or have them imposed is in relation to the TCFD, the uh, Task Force for um, Climate Related Financial Disclosures. But I think that's just the tip of the iceberg. Um, the expectations from all stakeholders that, 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 that business respond uh, to this agenda is growing. And I think as the headline suggests, um, not responding voluntarily will, will lead to um, an imposition of, of rules. The, the Uber stripped of their London license headline, they were back in the news this week, but I, I like this headline the best just because it so explicitly spells it out. Too often, issues like those uh, addressed by the SDGs have been lumped into a, you know, into a box that labeled non-financial. And, and I think we really need to break down that thinking. Um, perhaps they weren't traditionally uh, financial issues, but more and more, um, the question of corporate responsibility, certainly Uber isn't gonna think it's a non-financial issue anymore. And, and I, I would advise everyone else to to, to think similarly. And then the, the pictures at the bottom are, are just, uh, again, timely. Uh, Extinction Rebellion are on the move. And the support uh, that this um, movement is garnering is really quite astounding. And I think it, it's definitely um, something that everybody needs to, to take note of. Uh, there, there will be nowhere to hide and, and the populism um, that they are activating um, could be a very powerful force. And, and I think it's really clear that no company would want their brands on the wrong side of a movement like this. And the only way to, to stay on the right side is to be uh, genuinely um, doing the right thing and moving in the right direction. Um, just comes to mind, I had the pleasure of, of being invited to uh, an event uh, last week at which David Attenborough spoke and he he drew a parallel between what's happening now and the mid 19th century when um, when slavery went from being perfectly acceptable normal thing to within 20 years perfectly unacceptable um, thing and and David Attenborough's view was that we're in that moment now when it comes to the environment and and climate change so hopefully not too late, but a definite feeling that we've perhaps, if not we're if we're not there yet, we're, we're perhaps in the middle of that tipping point where the, the momentum behind change around this is is just going to overwhelm. So what can you do about it? We are very keen on uh, the SDG Compass as a starting point at the very least um, for you to to move forward with this agenda. Um, www.sdgcompass.org, you can get more information about it. This was a collaborative effort between the UN Global Compact, the World Business Council for Sustainable Development, and the Global Reporting Initiative. It's very simple, I'll run, there's more depth, but I'll run through. Understanding the SDGs needs no real explanation. Defining priorities, this is the mapping exercise that, that many of you may have already done. Um, what we're looking for here is that you look at your whole value chain, 
and you look at the SDG targets, not, not the 17 goals, the targets, and then look where your activities are having positive or negative impacts against those targets. And it will be evident from this exercise where um, your most significant impacts are, either positive or negative. And from that, you need to define priorities where you want to focus. There's no real expectation that every company is going to prioritize all 17 goals or all 169 targets. I think you're, you're very much expected to identify what's material and take action there. Um, some might like to label that cherry picking, but I think that's nonsense. And I think that taking a, a view on materiality is, is very sensible. Having defined priorities, you need to set goals. That's the only way we're going to really move this along. And I think the key thing that the SDGs bring is an external reference point um, upon which to base goals. If we set our goals you know, internally, looking inwards, and, and only think about what we can do, um, that really impacts the ambition. What we need to do is look externally, look to the SDGs, look to science at what, what we must do. And then we let, uh, let necessity be the mother of invention and we find a way to get there. So we really need to ramp up the ambition and aligning targets with the SDGs is, is a really important way to do that. Having set targets, they need to be integrated into your company. A great example here is um, SSE, the big energy company. They've linked senior management uh, remuneration into achieving their own uh, goals linked to the SDGs. That's how you integrate this agenda. There's high level of motivation there now to, to move forward on this. The final step in the cycle, although it is a cycle, so it just repeats itself, is reporting and communication. And it's really vital that the leaders lead and, and tell people their stories and, and the progress they're making so that others can follow suit. Um, and, and there's lots of guidance out there on, on how to report and communicate about the goals. That just brings to mind, uh, apologize for not mentioning sooner. Um, I hope that we will have some time at the end for questions. And if you wanted to type questions into the chat box, um, then I'll certainly do my best to address anything you, you specifically wanted to, um, to cover. Okay, this slide is um, just an example um, around goal three, ensuring healthy lives and promoting well-being for all at all ages. Unilever um, in India aligned their Lifebuoy soap marketing with a campaign uh, to get children to wash their hands with soap five times a day as a means of reducing mortality from waterborne diseases uh, really demonstrates a perfect alignment of a commercial interest and a societal interest. They've saved lots of lives and sold lots of soap. So this is the kind of thing that, you know, I imagine you'd all be pretty keen on tapping into. Another great example um, in the space of water, Marshalls is a, um, well, they're a pretty well-known company in, in, in the responsible business space and, and, and certainly in the built environment space. They, they produce paving stones and stone cladding uh, for buildings. And they're very conscious of this agenda and they're looking to it for business ideas and where are we going. And one of the things that they've developed um, is around flood prevention. And with the extreme weather that we can expect to see more of, um, increased prevalence of, of flooding incidents, especially in urban areas where the hard surfaces um, lead to rapid accumulation of water. They've developed water permeable paving that allows water to dissipate into the soil um, and thereby reduce flood risk. It, it's a hugely uh, sensible, forward-looking new product that they've developed aligned with this agenda. Another um, great idea Around goal eight, promoting sustained, inclusive, and sustainable economic growth, full and productive employment, and decent work for all is, of course, is, is the living wage. Um, this is pretty much how most people, I think, would define decent work um, is going to start with a living wage. Uh, the Living Wage Foundation here in the UK is, is a real leader in this space globally. 
uh, the companies that have already signed up to be living wage employers will tell you that it pays for itself in increased productivity, reduced turnover, um, and, and a generally happier workforce. Definitely something that everybody um, should take a look at. Okay. So some further, uh, further tools for your consideration. Um, the SDG industry matrices were uh, publications produced by UN Global Compact in collaboration with KPMG. Seven publications looking at seven different industry sectors. In each one, examples of activities that companies in that sector are doing for each of the goals. If you're looking for ideas about what you might do in your sector, even if your sector is not covered here, you can always extrapolate um, tons of great ideas um, for action that, that companies are already engaging in. A couple of publications produced by UN Global Compact, the Global Reporting Initiative um, in collaboration this time with, with PwC, um, fantastic guidance on uh, how to report on the SDGs. The Blueprint for Business Leadership on the SDGs is a UN Global Compact production. Um, if you just want to be in the pack, that's fine. There's, there's plenty of guidance for that. But to be a, a true leader in the SDG space, this publication goes a long ways to defining what that means. And, and a big part of that, of course, is uh, around um, additionality. And, and this is really a problem. Too many companies now are, are doing that first step the second step in the compass, the defining priorities, mapping what they're already doing against the SDGs, slapping these SDG icons in their sustainability report um, and carrying on. It's really the very definition of business as usual. We need additionality. We need people to set targets, get out of their comfort zone and really move this uh, along. On our website, the Global Compact UK Network website, we've got a page uh, with links to a whole bunch of SDG resources. So if you're looking for a shortcut, you can just go there and, and find everything you need. If you wanna know more yet on the Global Goals, we are nearing the end of our 2019 SDG Roadshow. We'll be visiting, well, we've already been to seven cities and we've got three more to go this year. Um, next up, uh, next week, we'll be in Birmingham, then Cardiff, then back in London and then Leeds to finish off the series. Um, it's a really interactive workshop where we um, basically work through the, the SDG compass in a little more detail, but really help sustainability professionals work on their influencing skills to make them more effective change agents, both in their, in their work and, and away from it. If you want more information about what's happening in the UK, the government uh, presented a voluntary national review at the UN in July, and you can see the link there to get that. The Office for National Statistics um, is a fantastic resource um, where you can see um, the official numbers on the official SDG indicators in real time. Um, the UK is leading the world in, in data collection around the SDGs, so it's certainly worth a read. And then I would also recommend publication produced by UK Stakeholders for Sustainable Development. Um, it's, this is back from uh, the spring of 2018, but I think it's still um, relevant and makes for a good read. And just about, uh, yeah, not too much time to spare. Um, that's, that brings us to an end. Um, we're very happy to share the slides when this is over. So yeah, watch your inbox for that. If anybody does want to ask a question, I'm happy to, I, I'm in no hurry to leave right away at, at 3.30, but if you wanna type something into chat, um, I'd be happy to address it. Otherwise, uh, thanks very much for your attention. Um, and uh, I hope you found this worthwhile. Have a great afternoon.